Welcome to the webinar entitled, Why on Earth Should I Work My Way Off SSDI? Why Losing Benefits Can Be Giving Yourself a Hand Instead of Shooting Yourself in the Foot. I'm Michael Dalto, a consultant with Griffin Hammes Associates and working with Missouri's Employment First State Leadership Mentoring Project. The objectives of today's webinar are to be able to explain why many people who receive Social Security Disability, otherwise known as Title II, are hesitant to work their way off cash benefits, to categorize people's willingness to consider working their way off Title II benefits uh, using colored profiles of green, yellow, and red that we'll get into in a few minutes, to identify work incentives advisement strategies for people in the different color categories and to apply some of these strategies through a couple of case studies. So for some background, most people who get Title II disability benefits can hardly imagine working their way off their cash benefits. Many of them had, had to fight hard and wait long to get benefits in the first place. Uh, fewer than one-third of people who apply for these benefits are approved on the first attempt. Uh, the second attempt, the first appeal, is less successful, only about half as successful as the first attempt. But the third try is often the charm. That's the second appeal when a majority of people actually get approved for benefits. But by that time, it can easily take over a year or over two years. Most people who go through that third attempt, the second appeal, hire an attorney who can claim about 25% of the retroactive benefit. And while people are waiting to get approved, they often use up their life savings just surviving. Uh, if they're lucky enough to have life savings. So by the time people get approved for benefits, uh, many have had to go through a great deal of hardship and are very, very reluctant to do anything to jeopardize those benefits. Another issue about Title II benefits is that they're all or nothing. If a person has earnings below uh, a certain limit, indefinitely, they can keep the full amount of the Title II benefit indefinitely. If they have earnings above a certain amount, known as SGA or substantial gainful activity, and they earn above SGA for a long enough period, their benefit isn't just reduced, it goes down to zero, which makes it an even more frightening prospect for people to work their way off cash benefits because they either get the full amount or zero. Now, people become accustomed to relying on Title II benefits as their livelihood. They don't provide that much money, but beneficiaries begin to think of them as financial security. Here's money that will come, be directly deposited into my account the same day each month. It may not be a lot, but it's just enough for me to get by, to pay for my basic living expenses. People think of these benefits as guaranteed income. But the dirty little secret of Title II benefits is that they often are a source of guaranteed poverty. If individuals refuse to work at all or refuse to earn above a certain amount, typically SGA this year in 2019 is $1,220 a month gross wages for non-blind people and $2,040 a month gross wages for blind individuals, if they refuse to work at all or to earn above those amounts, people are essentially taking a vow of poverty. They're guaranteeing that their incomes will never rise much above the poverty line. The good news is if a person commits to work their way off Title II benefits, then they can earn as much as they want the sky becomes the limit. They no longer have to worry about keeping their earnings below 
SGA. The trick is to persuade people that they can be better off working generally full-time above SGA and having their Title II benefits stop than to work part-time below SGA and continue their Title II benefits. So if you're a benefit navigator or a benefit planner or a CWIC, you should offer people who receive Title II benefits enough information so they can make a truly informed choice about how much their earnings goal should be. Now, the way you approach this discussion depends on the concerns, fears, and motivations a person has about their Title II benefits. We'll get into the the color profiles um, describing three different levels of fear and motivation regarding Title II benefits in a few slides. But first, I just wanted to say that sometimes it's a good idea to go ahead and explain the impact of full-time work very quickly. Other times, it's best to go very carefully and cautiously. And still other times, you want to go very slowly and at least at first not even mention the possibility of someone working their way off cash benefits. So let's go into a few profiles of people's motivations regarding Title II benefits that helps describe which approach you should take for the person. So green people are in the go mode. They're highly motivated to work. They generally want to earn as much as they can. They're definitely willing to go to work full time right off the bat. Many of them really don't care if they lose their cash benefits from Title II. Some of them actually want to lose those benefits. They'll tell you, I never wanted these benefits in the first place. I would rather work my way off them. Many people in the green category value their independence. They often mistrust government. They don't want to take benefits that they consider to be charity. Or they simply want to regain a better standard of living than Social Security benefits provide. They want to be able to work full time, uh, generally like they did before they received Title II benefits. They're often willing to work full-time and have their Title II benefits stop, even if their net income would be higher if they worked part-time with earnings below SGA and kept their Title II payments. Yellow people are cautious about losing their Title II benefits. People in the yellow zone want to work, they want to increase their incomes, but they're ca careful about risking benefits that they've come to rely on. They may be willing to consider losing some benefits, including Title II cash benefits, but not necessarily right away. They may want to start out working part-time or keeping their earnings below SGA they might be willing to consider working their way off Title II, but generally further into the future. And they want to know what work incentives, which safety nets, they have available if they do work their way off Title II. Yellow people want to know that if they work full-time above SGA and work their way off Title II benefits, that they'll have much more money than if they limit their earnings, keeping them below SGA and keeping their cash benefits. They also want to know that if they work their way off cash benefits and then something happens to their job, they'll be able to get the cash benefits back again quickly and easily without having to reapply. And finally, they want to be sure 
that they can keep their medical benefits while they're working, even if their Title II cash benefits stop. Many uh, people in the yellow zone would be willing to consider working their way off cash benefits, but not the medical benefits that are so essential to them. Finally, red people or stop people don't take any chances with their benefits. They're often just absolutely terrified of losing Title II benefits and sometimes other benefits they receive. Many are unwilling to even consider work. Uh, those who are willing to work are willing to consider work if they're certain that they won't lose essential benefits, particularly Title II cash benefits. But many are a bit paranoid and are concerned that even if you explain to them what the rules are and the fact that they could work and still keep their Title II benefits, um, they're afraid that something may go wrong anyway. You've heard of Murphy's Law. Many people in the red zone believe that Murphy worked for Social Security. Uh, many people in the red zone are also so panicked that they believe that if any benefit they have is even reduced a little rather than cut off, this would of course be benefits other than Title II, they will be on a fast and slippery slope to perdition and they will eventually lose that benefit and other benefits they get completely. So if red people are willing to work at all, they don't even want to hear about the possibility of losing benefits, especially Title II benefits. Red people have always, often, almost always, heard horror stories about people who went to work, lost benefits that they needed, ended up with huge overpayments, etc. So red people, if they're going to work, need to see good things happen regarding their benefits to help overcome their fears. Now, in the Title II world, as in the natural world, oftentimes these colors blend um, and you'll find that there are fewer green people than there are yellow or red people. When the colors mix, it's not uncommon to find people who are orange or chartreuse, a mixture of red and yellow or of uh, yellow and green, for example. Sometimes people's motivations may change over time. People who are re raring and ready to go and work full time and consider working their way off benefits may grow more cautious later on when the rubber meets the road and their benefits might actually stop. Also, on the flip side, people who are terrified of losing their benefits or in the deep red zone may eventually soften their stance and be a little more, uh, more willing to consider having their cash benefits stop, maybe more in the orange zone. But it's definitely the case that yellow is the most common color in this spectrum, whether a person is squarely in the yellow camp or if they're kind of mixed with green or red. And for that reason, it's usually very important to show people the strategies for yellow people, unless they're solidly in the green or red camp. So it's important to show them that they can be better off financially working full time if they can earn enough, receiving just their earnings and having their Title II payments stop, than they would be working part time below SGA and, and keeping Title II payments. It's important to highlight the work incentives that will let them keep their medical benefits even if they work their way off their cash benefits and work incentives that will let them get their cash benefits back without having to reapply fairly quickly and easily if they work their way off the cash benefits and later their earnings drop or stop. So the benefits advisement you should use 
with people who receive Title II benefits depends on which color in the spectrum fits their, their profile best. So for green people, those who are raring to go, work full time, happy to work their way off Title II benefits, you want to start working with them quickly. They're eager to work. Oftentimes, they're impatient about waiting too long to start looking for work. You want to show them that they're going to be better off working than not working. You can highlight the advantages of full-time work if it's available and help the person make an informed choice about whether to work full-time. You can show people generally pretty quickly and, uh, and cursorily the work incentives that may be relevant to them. Those that will let them keep cash benefits for up to a year while they're working full-time if they have not used their trial work period and their grace period yet. To show them that after their cash benefits have stopped, if they do work full-time beyond their trial work period and grace period, that they can get those benefits back quickly and easily if their earnings later drop below SGA or stop. And you want to highlight the work incentives that let them keep Medicare even if they've worked their way off Title II cash benefits. It's a good idea to consider and show them the Ticket to Work Health Assurance Program, Missouri's Medicaid buy-in program, as a way to get or keep Medicaid, also known as Mo Health Net, if the person is working, even if they're earning enough to stop their Title II benefit. Moving on to yellow people. The advisement strategy for yellow people naturally would be a bit more cautious. At first, you may need to focus on how a person can keep their earnings below SGA. Now, if they're offered a job with wages above the usual SGA level, $1,220 a month for non-blind people, or $2,040 a month for blind people, then you want to emphasize the deductions from earnings that can enable that their earnings to stay below SGA even if their gross wages are above the SGA dollar amount. That, of course, would be impairment-related work expenses or EARWIs, those disability-related expenses people need to pay for in order to work, and subsidies and special conditions. These would be examples of when a person's uh, productivity is not accurately reflected by the earnings they receive. Either they're working at a reduced rate of productivity or they're getting extra help or supervision to do the job even though they're paid the full wage. Now if you're a benefit navigator or a benefit planner and you want to help somebody use early subsidies and special conditions it's always important to coordinate with a CWIC, a Community Work Incentives Coordinator, to help, the, help you help the individual use these work incentives. Secondly, you can help yellow people consider, at least in the future, full-time earnings that would yield higher net income, even without Title II benefits, than if they worked below SGA and kept Title II benefits. Third, you can use the DB101 Benefits and Work Estimator to highlight the net income and other results for a person depending on which earning scenarios they choose. So you could compare part-time work below SGA and full-time work above SGA to highlight what their net income would be in each scenario, and also their Ticket to Work Health Assurance eligibility so they could get or keep Medicaid while working. Now, if the person expresses any interest in maybe in the future 
considering earnings high enough to stop their Title II benefits, then you immediately want to underscore the work incentives that would let them keep their Medicare indefinitely while they're working, even if they earn enough to stop their Title II benefits, and the work incentives that would let them get their cash benefits back without having to reapply if their earnings later fell below SGA or they stopped working. And if you're a benefit navigator or a benefit planner and an individual is considering earnings that might stop their Title II benefit eventually, you want to bring in the help of a CWIC. Now, for red people, of course, you need to be extremely cautious and approach the issue, these issues very slowly and delicately. At first, you probably don't want to mention the possibility of the person earning enough to stop their Title II benefit at all. Uh, many people in the red zone are barely willing to even consider working. They certainly wouldn't be willing to consider it if they thought they might lose their Title II cash benefits. So initially, if the person is willing to consider working at all, you should focus on work incentives that will protect benefits and make sure people have increased income and or reduced out-of-pocket costs. You can use the DB101 Benefits and Work Estimator to show a person the impact of earnings below SGA and show them that they'd be able to keep their full Title II benefits and perhaps show them that if they're working, they can use the earned income tax credit to get a larger tax refund. Many people, especially those with young children, can receive a larger refund with the help of the earned income tax credit than all of the taxes withheld from their pay. In other words, the government is actually paying them extra to work, which can be a great incentive for red people. Now, red people need to be won over. This, of course, is helpful for yellow and green people as well, but especially for red people who are reluctant, often initially, to even consider working, let alone working above SGA. So people need you to show them good things happening, uh, such as being able to keep their Title II benefits, um, maybe to qualify for Medicaid through the Ticket to Work Health Assurance Program, maybe qualifying for large tax refunds through the Earned Income Tax Credit. If you can show people good things happening and, they're, and, and the fact that they're not losing benefits, they will trust you more about more difficult issues down the road. You can certainly highlight the positive results for a red person using the benefits and work estimator on DB101. If a person is just so fearful about work that they're really not willing to consider working despite your best efforts, if you work with other individuals who used to be in that red zone, used to be that panicked about work, but eventually had their fears alleviated enough that they did go to work, perhaps you could connect the red person you're advising with another person who used to be in that situation and let them discuss how they used work incentives successfully, how they went to work without their greatest fear is being realized. Of course, you'd need the consent of the person, uh, both parties, in order to connect them. But oftentimes, hearing from somebody who's actually been there uh, can be much more effective than hearing this message from a non-disabled professional. Now, if a red person's fears begin to ease enough over time, then you can gradually move over into strategies for yellow people. But do it very carefully. Now, I wanted to highlight something that you should never do when you're providing benefits advisement to someone who receives Title II benefits. 
You want to never show the beneficiary a comparison of earnings scenarios that suggests it's a bad idea for them to work full time. And here's an example. Jasmine gets $1,000 a month SSDI and earns an average of $1,083 a month gross wages. In her case, that's $10 an hour, working 25 hours a week. Multiplying that by 4.33 weeks in the average month, we get 1,083 gross wages. Now, 1,083 gross wages is comfortably below the $1,220 a month SGA level for a non-blind person, so Jasmine should keep her SSDI while she's working in this part-time job, and her total monthly income would be $2,083 a month. Now, if Jasmine worked full-time 40 hours a week at the same $10 an hour, her average gross wages would be $1,733 a month. $10 an hour, 40 hours a week, 4.33 weeks per month. With earnings that high, particularly if she's not blind, her SSDI would most likely stop. It would be suspended after her trial work period and grace period. So she'd have only her earnings and not her SSDI working in that job after her trial work period and grace period. So you could then show her a comparison of her current 25 hour a week job and working 40 hours a week at the same $10 an hour. And it would look something like this. Now, not working, of course, her net income would be just her $1,000 of SSDI. Working 25 hours a week at $10 an hour, keeping her earnings below SGA, she would keep her SSDI and get her wages. After taxes and paying the Medicare Part B premium, which she would need to do if she was earning that much and keeping SSDI as well, her net income would be about $1,848.50 a month, obviously much better than if she's not working. However, if she worked 40 hours a week at $10 an hour and had her SSDI stop after her trial work period and grace period ended, if her taxes were $243 a month, which is roughly what they would be at that level of earnings, with those earnings and without SSDI, she actually would not have to pay the Medicare Part B premium. But even so, after taxes, her net income would be only about $1,490 a month, which is much less about $350 a month less than if she worked 25 hours a week and kept SSDI. That comparison is like putting up a billboard that says, don't work full time, you'll have less money. And I advise you to never do that with a Title II beneficiary. What you can do instead is consider full time work at a higher hourly wage that would leave Jasmine better off financially, even without Title II benefits, working full time than if she worked part time and kept her earnings below SGA. So suppose Jasmine could work full time and earn $16 an hour. Now the comparison would look very different. The first two columns not working and working 25 hours a week, she would have the same net income that she did when we first looked at this comparison. Not working, her net income would be $1,000 a month. Working 25 hours a week at $10 an hour, her net income would be about $1,848.50 a month. But if she worked 40 hours a week earning $16 an hour rather than $10 an hour, after her trial work period and grace period, she'd have $2,773 a month average gross wages. And after the roughly $501 a month of taxes she'd pay on those earnings, 
her net income would be $2,272 a month, which is several hundred dollars, more than $400 a month higher than her net income working part-time and keeping her SSDI. So the second comparison chart holds out hope to Jasmine that if she could earn enough working full-time, even though she'd work her way off SSDI, she would be better off financially than she would if she worked part-time and kept her SSDI. This plants a seed for Jasmine that even if she's not in a position to earn $16 an hour now, if she could in the future, perhaps with the help of additional training, education, technology, etc., she could actually be better off financially working her way off Title II. Even if that never happens, you will have at least planted the seed for Jasmine so she'll know that she could potentially be better off working full-time if she could earn a high enough hourly wage. And you might be the only person in Jasmine's life who will ever convey that message to her. So now let's go through a couple of examples. First, let's start with Josiah, who receives $864 a month SSDI. He gets Medicare. He gets Mo Health Net or Medicaid without a spend down and Quimby, Qualified Medicare Beneficiary Benefit. He's 26 years old, he's not married, he has no children. He's offered a full-time job with an auto company. His average gross wages will be about $2,700 a month, and he'll be paying about $300 a month for work-related transportation. He's not worried about losing his SSDI cash benefit, but he's a little concerned about losing Medicare and Mo Health Net. So looking at Josiah's circumstances, which of the color profiles would you think he seems to fit best? Green, yellow, or red? The correct answer, of course, is green. As Josiah is ready to work full time, he's not concerned about losing his SSDI cash benefit. And the second question would be, what earnings scenarios would you want to show Josiah considering he's in the green zone? And the answer I would give is you'd want to show him his current scenario not working and what would happen if he worked full-time in the job that he's been offered. And if you showed that comparison, you'd come up with a chart something like this. If Josiah is not working, his net income, of course, is just his SSDI of $864 a month. If he works full-time in the job he's been offered, earning $2,700 a month gross wages, then after his trial work period and his grace period, you would certainly expect his SSDI benefit would stop. After paying the $300 in work-related travel expenses, approximately $480 in taxes on his earnings, the Medicare Part B premium, which would be $135.50 a month, and if he chose to keep his Medicaid through the Ticket to Work Health Assurance Program, his Ticket to Work Health Assurance premium would be $152 a month. After all of those expenses, he would have $1,632.50 approximately net income. Now that's probably all Josiah needs to see because he's not concerned about having his Title II benefit, his SSDI, stop. 
you don't need to show him a scenario where he would work part-time below SGA and keep his SSDI. He's just concerned about making sure that he's better off working full-time even after his Title II stops than he would be if he were not working. And he's clearly much better off. His net income is almost double working full-time without his SSDI than not working at all. And finally, example two is Kara, who receives $1,100 a month of SSDI and Medicare. She's 48 years old, not married, has no children, and she earns $16 an hour working 14 hours a week. That's an average of $970 a month gross wages. She's concerned about earning enough to lose her SSDI. She's very concerned about the possibility of losing her Medicare as well. Now, Kara drives about 350 miles per month in her adapted car for work-related purposes. That's allowed as an impairment-related work expense, an IRWI by Social Security, at 58 cents a mile, the current IRS mileage rate for 2019. 350 work-related mile, miles at 58 cents a mile works out to an IRWI of $203 a month. If Kara worked full-time, she would be able to earn more. Her employer has told her that if she worked full-time, she would earn $20 an hour rather than 16. And she'd get paid leave and a 403B retirement plan. She would also be driving about double the number of miles per month for work. So looking at Kara's situation, which of the color categories would you say fits Kara the most? And if you said yellow, you're correct, because she's already working, she's certainly willing to work, but is definitely concerned about earning enough to stop her SSDI and does not want to lose her Medicare. And which work scenarios, which earning scenarios, do you think you would show Kara in order for her to make an informed choice about work and possibly increasing her earnings? Well, I would show her three. First, her current earnings scenario, where she's earning only $970 a month gross wages, which is well, well below SGA. I'd show her a second scenario in which she kept her earnings just below SGA. And then finally, a, the scenario in which she would work full-time earning $20 an hour. And comparing those scenarios would give you a chart that looks something like this. So working below SGA, and she's well below SGA now, working 14 hours a week at $16 an hour, her earnings are only $970 a month. She gets to keep her $1,100 a month of SSDI. The early for her mileage would be $203 a month. She'd be paying about $80 a month, is paying about $80 a month in taxes on her earnings, and is paying the Medicare Part B premium of $135.50. And her net income is about $1,651.50. Now, because her earnings are well below SGA, and because she has an early that would enable her to earn more than $1,220 a month and still be below SGA, we can look at having her work more hours at $16 an hour 
and still have earnings below SGA. And in fact, if you play around with the numbers a little bit, you'll see that if Kara worked 20 hours a week at $16 an hour and had average gross wages of $1,386 a month, because of that $203 a month early for work-related mileage on her modified vehicle, after subtracting the early from her wages, her earnings would still be below SGA. If you take $1,386 a month gross wages, subtract the $203 a month transportation early, her countable wages would be 1183 which is below the $1,220 a month SGA level for a non-blind person. So even though her gross wages would be more than $1,220, after subtracting the early for her work-related mileage, Kara's earnings her countable earnings would be below SGA, and she could keep her $1,100 of SSDI. Now, she'd still be paying the mileage-related expenses on her car, her gas, maintenance, repairs, etc. Her taxes would be about $164 a month. She'd still pay the Medicare Part B premium, and her net income after those expenses would be about $1,983.50 a month. Finally, we compare this situation to Kara working full-time 40 hours a week at the $20 an hour her employer said she could earn if she accepted a full-time position. Now, working 40 hours a week at $20 an hour Kara's gross wages would be $3,464 a month, way above the $1,220 a month SGA level. So since Kara has already used up her trial work period, and after her grace period, her SSDI would stop. She'd be paying for about double the mileage costs, since she'd be driving about double the number of miles for the job, so her mileage cost would be about $406 a month. She'd pay about $674 a month in taxes, and she'd pay the Part B premium again of $135.50 a month. And after those expenses, her net income would be $2,248.50. So that's several hundred dollars more than if she worked just below SGA, working 20 hours a week, and kept her SSDI. The decision, of course, would be Kara's, and you would not be pressuring her to work full-time, but you'd simply be showing her that if she worked full-time, she would, in fact, have a greater, substantially greater net income than if she worked 20 hours a week and stayed just below SGA and kept her SSDI. This enables Kara to make a truly informed choice. She may be likely to keep her earnings below SGA, at least at first, but she might be interested in increasing her hours from 14 hours a week to as many as 20 hours a week which would still keep her below SGA and keep her SSDI. But she would also know that perhaps down the road or perhaps sooner, if she accepted a full-time job from her, her employer earning $20 an hour, she would have more money even after her SSDI stopped. Now, in addition to having more net income, with the full-time job, Kara would also get paid leave and a 403B retirement plan, which certainly add to the value of choosing full-time employment. So, your mission in providing benefits advisement is 
to consider a person's motivation to categorize them in the green, yellow, or red zone, and then follow the appropriate strategy. For green people, you want to reach them quickly and help them work, preferably full-time. For yellow people, you want to support them to work more than they otherwise might. As we showed Kara, she could earn uh, work more hours a week and still keep her SSDI and show them that they could, if they could earn enough working full time, could be better off financially working their way off Title II than keeping earnings below SGA and keeping Title II sooner or later. And finally, for red people, you just want to gently soften their resistance, show them good things happening, benefits being protected, possibly increasing, um, expenses going down, etc. Now, if you think it'll never work, think again. It is definitely likely that most people on Title II benefits will choose to keep their earnings below SGA, but some, especially if you follow these strategies, will choose to work full-time above SGA sooner or later. Now, if you reach people early enough in their decision process about work, if they understand that they could be better off working full-time without Title II benefits than working part-time and keeping Title II benefits, many of them will at least consider choosing a higher earnings goal from the start. They might need to get additional education, training, uh, technology, et cetera, but more people will consider working full-time at a higher hourly rate if they realize they could be better off even without their Title II. Now, if you do persuade a person that they're going to be better off working their way off Title II, and they do that, then you can also help them enjoy a greater measure of freedom because once they've worked their way off Title II, they no longer need to worry about limiting their earnings and making sure they stay below SGA. Now they can focus on earning as much as they can. And then their net income has a much better chance of increasing over time. And thank you very much for your time and attention. If you have questions, please address them to the Ticket to Work helpline. Thank you.